We have, uh, uh, is Tom uh, Johnson here? Uh, Mr. Johnson, whenever you're ready, just uh, for, the, for the record, uh, state your name, uh, area you represent, and we can move forward. Appreciate it. Okay. Good morning, or I guess it's afternoon. Um, my name is Tom Johnson. I am a vice president of Alpha Geoscience in Clifton Park, New York. I am a hydrogeologist with 33 years of experience in geologic, hydrogeologic, in, and as an environmental consultant. Alpha Geoscience is engaged throughout New York and other parts of the U.S. in projects involving water contamination and treatment to clean the water and return it to the environment for reuse. I appreciate and thank both you, Chairman, and Senator Galvan, and other members of the Standing Committee on the Environmental Conservation for organizing this hearing to further explore this important opportunity for New York and for allowing me to speak today. I would like to address two statements today that I have often heard as reasons why gas drilling should not be allowed in New York State. These are hydraulic fracturing will contaminate, drink, contaminate drinking water aquifers and the water cannot be cleaned once it is contaminated. Neither of these statements is based on scientific fact and I'd like to explain why. A combination of several principles of geology and physics prevent migration of hydraulic fracturing fluids from the deep target fracture zones. Hydraulic fracturing would occur at depths of a few thousand to several thousand feet in New York if horizontal drilling and high volume hydrofracturing proceeded in New York. In contrast, drinking water aquifers are no deeper than about 800 feet. And in fact, most drinking water wells are completed at depths of a few hundred feet. Two criteria are necessary for the hydraulic fracturing fluids to reach the aquifers, and neither criterion is met. First, there would need to be a pathway for the fluids to travel through the thousands of feet of overlying low permeability rock. Lithostatic pressure is the pressure that is exerted by overlying rocks. This pressure is so great in the zones that would be drilled and fractured that neither natural nor man-made fractures remain open. This is why sand or other materials known as propens are necessary to be pumped into the ground to hold the man-made fractures open. This is also one of the reasons that gas in the deep geologic formations remains in place until a well is drilled. In addition to this requirement that there be a pathway, the pressure in the fracture zone must be greater than the pressure in the aquifer for any upward flow to occur. The pressure in the drilled borehole is raised temporarily enough to fracture the rock during the hydrofracturing process. However, the entire hydraulic fracturing of a single well takes only one day after which the pressure is released to allow the gas and fluids from the rock to flow into the borehole. Once the well is producing, the gas and other fluids will flow only towards the borehole, which offers a path of least resistance. These fundamental scientific principles preclude hydraulic fracturing fluids from flowing upward into drinking water aquifers. Additionally, New York has had a redundant casing and cementing program in place for more than 20 years. The absence of groundwater contamination despite thousands of oil and gas wells being drilled in New York demonstrates the adequacy of this program to protect the waters of the state. This casing and cementing program is further strengthened in the revised draft SGEIS and it provides the necessary protections to prevent groundwater problems that are being reported in other states and highlighted in the media. In regards to water treatment, 
critics of gas drilling have stated there is no way to clean the so-called flowback water that returns to the surface after the hydraulic fracturing process. In fact, millions of gallons of industrial wastewater are processed and treated every day in this country to remove contaminants in much higher concentrations than what is found in flowback water. Standard water treatment technologies that have been developed to treat water from landfills, chemical plants, plating facilities, mills, quarries, petroleum refineries, and a range of other industrial and commercial businesses are equally applicable and effective in treating flowback water. Many private, treat, private water treatment companies and facilities are operating in Pennsylvania, as you've heard, and in other states where high volume hydraulic fracturing currently is being performed. These businesses and facilities are not the same as the publicly owned wastewater treatment plants that we've heard about this morning and that have been the focus of media attention as being inadequate for treatment of hydraulic fracturing fluid. There are a variety of treatment methods being used, but the process generally consists of removing suspended solids and organics and then precipitating the undesirable metals. The low level of radioactive material known as NORM precipitates with the metals to form a sludge which is disposed at permitted regulated, regulated landfills as we heard from the de deputy commissioner. <clears throat> Studies and monitoring have shown that the radioactivity in the sludge is not present at levels that constitute a health concern to workers or the public. 90% or more of the treated water is reused for subsequent hydraulic fracturing jobs after this preliminary treatment. Water that contains too much salt and dissolved solids often is disposed in deep injection wells that are permitted under both federal and state regulations. A lesser known fact is that a crystallization technology has been refined and developed to treat the brine, or the salty water, that is currently disposed in injection wells. The crystallization process produces distilled water, salt that can be used in water softeners and livestock feed, and a liquid brine that can be used for road de-icing and dust suppression. There is no sludge or liquid discharge from this crystallization treatment process. Commensurate with the start of horizontal drilling and high volume hydraulic fracturing in New York, private businesses will build wastewater treatment plants at strategic locations to effectively and safely treat flowback and produced water. The water treatment industry is just one example of related businesses that provides permanent jobs to support the energy industry. Finally, I would like to address the effect that the current delay in New York State to permit horizontal drilling and high volume hydro hydraulic fracturing has on business and jobs. As a small business owner, I expect that my company likely could hire uh, anywhere from three to five geologists to support drilling activity in this state. These jobs represent a potential growth for my small business of 20 to 30 percent of our core business that is not being realized because of the delay. Additionally, my company is involved in a partnership to develop water treatment plants that I've described. Unfortunately, we cannot wait for this opportunity to develop in New York and we plan to initially build uh, up to four plants in Pennsylvania. We anticipate that each plant will employ approximately 12 to 15 people in permanent well-paying jobs. It is likely that one or more of these plants will be located in northern Pennsylvania at locations that may then preclude the need to build similar plants in southern New York. There's no doubt that the, the delay to allow horizontal drilling and high volume hydrofracturing has caused and continues to cause business to locate in Pennsylvania that might have lo located in New York. The likelihood increases as, as the delay continues that more jobs and businesses will not be realized in New York and may be permanently lost. I respectfully urge our elected leaders to facilitate the process to finalize the revised draft SGEIS and associated regulations that allow horizontal drilling and high volume hydrofracturing to proceed in New York in a safe, responsible manner. The DEC has proven for many years that it can and will 
effectively regulate oil, the oil and gas industry. That concludes my comments, and I thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to speak here today. Thanks, Mr. Johnson. I appreciate uh, the fact you've submitted testimony and, uh, and explaining such. I just have a few questions for you. The, um, you know, you've heard testimony from, uh, from the uh, <clears throat> Deputy Commissioner and uh, there's only been a couple of Mr. Wood basically talking about that there does not seem to be a, a safe alternative. So I, I take it those four things that he cited, Mr. Wood, the last speaker, based on your being a hydro uh, uh, geologist, would say that yes, we can treat in these facilities, whether you do it by um, uh, private, public, or what have you. It's your, it's your belief that this wastewater can be treated. Yes, it is my belief that it can be effectively treated and disposed. Uh, this country has had for many, many years a deep injection well program, as I said, that's been regulated by states and the federal government. Uh, it's, it's not widely known by the public, certainly, but there are thousands of wells, uh, deep injection wells, uh, many of them located in the western New York, uh, where all kinds of industrial waste are injected into the ground, deep into the ground, well below drinking water aquifers. Um, that program is not uh, as uh, vital here in the northeast because of the geology. The western geology is more suitable for that. There are wells in Pennsylvania. There are a few deep disposal wells in New York. However, Ohio has better geology, and there are uh, many more deep disposal wells in Ohio than there are in Pennsylvania and New York. And that right now is where uh, a lot of that uh, wastewater is being taken by the oil and gas industry for disposal uh, from the Marcellus play. And we're talking, we're talking that when, when you have a wall pad that's drilled, you're talking about, what, what is your estimate on the percentage of water that's gonna, that stays in the ground and then what comes back up through a flowback? Well, the, the, the general estimates are uh, about 10 to 30 percent will flow back. However, I think practically what's being seen right now is that that number is really on the low end. Uh, and I believe the deputy commissioner's testimony says something in the range of uh, 9 or 10 percent actually flows back and the rest remains underground. And is it, is it true what your testimony is saying that based on New York's sort of revised regulations on the casing and the types of the, the, the cement versus steel and the casings uh, and the regulations that are in place. It, it, because, I mean, I agree with you that it's, it's because it's several thousand feet down and under the geology, the different layers of, of, of rock and formation, very difficult for the water, besides gravity, of coming back up unless it's following that path of the, of the casing pipe. Um, but still, I mean, accidents can happen, and you could have a casing that breaks, and, and water can come back up, and it can, it can still uh, uh, find its way, whether it's in a stream or even if it's, there's a buffer zone, it could still have the potential of finding its way into a well or, or something along those lines, correct? Yes, and DEC has had uh, more extensive casing and cementing regulations than other states uh, for quite a while since the, the 1992 regulations were implemented. And we've seen that these regulations have served very well in protecting the groundwater resources. Uh, other states have not had as good regulations. And in fact, that uh, those uh, lapses in regulation are exactly what caused the problems in Dimmick that we've all heard about. And with respect to the, uh, the situation in Wyoming right now, if you, if you dig into that report, you'll see also that there's um, some pretty so strong suspicion that the casing and cementing was at least part of the problem that they're, they're starting to see out there. So it's important to realize that uh, the vertical, vertical wells that have been drilled in this state for years are drilled exactly the same way as the upper portion of a horizontal well. The casing requirements are the same. So that if it, we've been doing it safely for many years, that will not change as far as the upper portion of the well that penetrates through the aquifers in the first uh, several, a few thousand feet of the, uh, the vertical uh, rock that is drilled. Okay, and you talked about, um, you, saw the, you saw the photos that the uh, deputy commissioner had here regarding his open pit and his ponds, and he was talking about however long, uh, and, and it's different water, but however long it, it, it stays there, it can uh, have a higher concentration of, of uh, radioactivity, uh, more so than what has been stated to be 
uh, non cause of effect for health concerns, but there is that potential of depending on the length of time that it stays in these holding ponds and it could concentrate. You, you would agree with that assessment? Yes, sir. Uh, both in the holding ponds and in the case of New York will be held in the uh, steel tanks. Any, any place the water stays for any period of time, there is the possibility for uh, the concentrations to build up. And uh, that is why the SGEIS uh, has provisions to monitor that uh, so that we'll be able to protect the workers and the public yeah, would that then be treated then as, as hazardous waste if it gets to that high of a level? Um, that's a little beyond my area of knowledge, so I'm, I'm going to... Uh, would, you, would you, I mean, would that be something that you would consider if it, if it reaches that extreme, it should be considered as hazardous waste? I am not sufficiently well versed in the hazardous waste regulations, so I'm going to ask, uh, I'll pass on that. <laughs> The, uh, and you're involved in, in Pennsylvania right now with regards to specific uh, well pads and, and, and testing and work that's being done in Pennsylvania? I am, I am not directly involved, no. Not direct, okay, not directly involved, okay, I thought you were. We have plans to, to do some, uh, some work and build some plants in Pennsylvania, but that has not come to fruition at this time. Okay, all right. I appreciate your testimony here today, and I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Senator Gallivan if he has any further questions. Thanks for being here today, Mr. Mr. Johnson. Uh, I have two questions, one in each area of your testimony. Um, th the first uh, has to do with contamination or potential contamination of drinking water, and specifically the aquifers. You testified about lithostatic pressure that is so great that the geology essentially um, would prevent the contamination of the aquifers however many feet above where the, horizon the uh, horizontal drilling is taking place. Mm. And also that the hydraulic fracturing of a single well will take about one day. Is there any risk of any flow of those uh, hydrofrac hydrofracking liquids during the process migrating upwards? No, there's not because of the short duration that the pressures are raised and because of the monitoring that occurs during that process. The, uh, the, um, the energy companies are very interested in making sure that the fractures don't extend any further than necessary uh, because they don't want to fracture areas beyond the target zone where they're trying to draw gas from. So this is a process that's uh, monitored with sophisticated equipment to make sure they know uh, how, how far the fractures are propagating. Uh, again, the distance we're talking about uh, generally is uh, four to 6,000 feet probably that the Marcellus zone will be developed and fractured and the drinking water aquifers, the maximum depth is about 800 feet. So you've got several thousand of, of feet of rock above or, or between where the fracturing is occurring and the drinking water aquifers. The second has to do with the actual treatment of the water once it's contaminated and, and it's uh, certainly your testimony that the water can be treated, correct? Yes. It, it, would it be your opinion, do, do the chemicals that are used in the hydrofracking solutions that, that the uh, drilling companies have indicated as proprietary, is it your opinion that they need to be disclosed in order for the water to be, tr the wastewater to be properly treated? Well, I, I think they should be disclosed and I believe the, the SGEIS requires that they be disclosed. Uh, what is interesting about some of the discussion and debate that is ongoing is that the, the chemicals that are actually added to the water for the fracturing process are in extremely small quantities. And in fact, the compounds that are coming back up in the, in the flow back water in the highest concentrations are the naturally occurring minerals that are in the rock. So as the water is injected into the rock and it stays there for a period of time uh, as the rock is fractured, those natural compounds leach out of the rock and into the water and are present at much higher concentrations than what is actually added for the fracturing process. So some of what you've heard about the barium, the strontium, the calcium, the sodium, the magnesium, all of these compounds and the salts are all natural and are what comes out of the rock during the hydrofracturing process and are not the, uh, the compounds that are added during the hydraulic fracturing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.
I have nothing further. I appreciate uh, you submitting your testimony and being here today and, uh, and taking questions from uh, myself and Senator Gallivan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Draw.